16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth to the Jew first and also the Greek. Lord, I pray that Brother, Brother Justin's sermon text will be good. In Jesus' name, amen. Morning, brethren. It is good to be here, isn't it? <clears throat> a lot of what I wanted to say today, it's already been, a lot of it's been said over the past few days, but I'm thankful that it has. I'm really thankful that it has. It would be a concerning thing if brethren met together in a place to talk about a certain subject and the messages didn't touch each other, wouldn't it? <laughs> So for see this is this is this is good. God is gracious to us. What he gives, he gives it in abundance. <clears throat> and I'm thankful to follow the leading of the Lord. And as we have heard, the gospel has to do with a proclamation. It's a proclamation of the work that God has done, is doing, and will do through his son Jesus Christ the Lord. <clears throat> Amen. It is a heavenly proclamation of the work of God in reconciling men into, unto himself, and it in, involves exposition, revelation, and declaration of his workings and our great salvation. Now, the theme of this year's renewal is the gospel in the epistles. <clears throat> and I'd like, I'd like for us to all consider that Paul was separated unto the gospel of God himself by God. It was his primary vocation. Now consider that every epistle Paul wrote is written to the saints of God. I'm going to go through it here just, just shortly. 1 Corinthians. Unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, and all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ the Lord. 2 Corinthians, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, and all the saints. Galatians, unto the churches of Galatia. Ephesians, to the saints, which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Philippians, to all the saints. Colossians, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ. 1 Thessalonians, unto the church. 2 Thessalonians, unto the church. 1 Timothy, unto Timothy, a believer. 2 Timothy, unto Timothy. Titus, to Titus, mine own son, after the common faith. And here, in the first chapter of Romans, Paul tells us who he is addressing in this letter. He says, to all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. <clears throat> Now, how can a person separated unto the gospel of God spend nearly all of his effort ministering to the saints of God if the gospel was not intended for the saints of God? He speaks about these believers in Rome and he acknowledges that their faith is being known throughout the whole world. He tells them how much he mentions them in his prayers and that they would be established with spiritual gifts. Of course, this is not surprising from a man who had the care of all the churches on his heart daily. He longs for his visit to Rome to be among the brethren that they would be mutually comforting one to another. And the conclusion of these things, how he is going to bring them about, so as much as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are, who are in Rome also. He said this to one whose faith was spoken of throughout the whole world. Now, do you think in our day, if there was a group of believers whose faith was spoken of in the entire world, that the mainstream professing church of our day would consider them to be a target of 
of by by which the gospel should be preached. See, it's a travesty of epic proportions that we live in a time when many in the church are saying things like, "We've already heard the gospel. Why don't you go out and preach it to those who are without?" As if the gospel stops being beneficial after conversion. If it did, how would it be the power of God and the salvation? If Paul was separated unto the gospel of Jesus Christ, and he is the chief apostle sent by God to expound these things to believing men, how could one conclude that the gospel is only for those who are on the outside? See, the only way that you could attempt to argue such a thing is if your view of salvation is shallow. Like if your view of salvation is being forgiven and placed in the fold, the end of story. Well, which one of you saves something that is going to be thrown away without intending to use it sometime in the future? And which one of you believes a builder is finished building the building only after the foundation is laid? Who gets into a college and takes no classes once they get in? Who gets a job and does no work? And which one of you plants a garden just for the sake of planting? Or do you plant a garden with the harvest in mind? God puts us into Christ with a harvest in mind, with a return on his investment. Salvation involves preparation. It involves fruitfulness. It involves usefulness to God. It involves sanctification. See, Paul knew this. He said, I will not have you to be ignorant. Peter knew this. He said, Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye know them, and be established in the present truth. But not only this, isn't this your own experience? That the thing that initially drew you to the gospel isn't necessarily the same thing that's keeping you in now. In other words, when I saw that I needed to be saved, I ran to God. I, I didn't want to be condemned. But once I got in, brethren, he's, he's led me to see things that I never thought, that I could never see before. And these things, these new things, that I'm, those are the things that's keeping me in. <clears throat> now, if anyone is in Christ Jesus, he is a new creature. There is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. So I'm going to announce that if you are in Christ today, you are not condemned. You are saved. <clears throat> but there is also the truth, brethren, that we are being saved. As long as we are in this world, there is a liability there. No one is truly safe until they make it to the other side. This is what salvation is. It's providing what men need to endure to the end with their faith in God still intact. Remember, Jesus himself said this. He said, but he that shall endure to the end shall be saved. <clears throat> See, there's a lot of things that have to be worked out of us, but there's even more things that have to be worked in us. And, and all of these things that have to be worked in us are all initiated by the gospel message. See, when you were born again, God not only forgave your sin and added you to the fold, but also put in you the ability to respond to him, to know him, to understand him. Conversion is not the end of the matter, but the beginning. The gospel is not only good news to the sinner by announcing the way out of condemnation, but it's good news to the believer by announcing what Christ is doing on our behalf at the right hand of God to bring many sons to glory. <clears throat> it, it, it increases hope in us. Our hope is he announces what we're going to get at the end of the road, our inheritance. So as a person is exposed to the gospel, it, their focus is redirected towards eternity. It puts reality the way things really are, the gospel puts it into its proper perspective. The main things are perceived as the main things. The lesser things are seen for the lesser things. It's a sobering message, brethren. It's an illuminating message. It's a comforting message. It's a peaceful message. It's a strengthening and empowering and enlightening message. It's a hopeful message. And it's the truth. It's a good, this good truth 
The ministration of the gospel causes this hope to spring up in us. It stirs us up and causes us to say, we are well able to go and take the country. We are well, if God is for us, who can be against us? See, that's provoked by the gospel. And Paul said, I'm not ashamed. I want to go over this. Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are not ashamed of this gospel. But see, there are many in our day who are ashamed of it. Christian people. Now, I'm... Of course, no one would ever stand up and say, I'm ashamed of the gospel. <clears throat> but they say it in what they value, what they place their emphasis on, when they've turned away from the gospel of God to another message. See, it's the gospel of God. It's not the gospel of man. <clears throat> it's the gospel of God. Paul warned of these other gospels. 2 Corinthians 11.4, look it up. It's plain as day. If any of you receive another gospel. <clears throat> so when God has declared that we are accepted by faith in his son, and a person preaches that we need to be circumcised to be accepted, they're preaching another gospel. <clears throat> it's a serious thing, brethren, because Christ becomes unprofitable to a person who accepts a false gospel. Amen. They're ashamed. Ashamed. This is Webster's 1828 Dictionary. The exposure of some gross errors or misconduct, which, of which the person is conscious, must be wrong, and which tends to impair his honor or reputation. It's followed by of, like ashamed of. I'm ashamed of you. I'm, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. <clears throat> In other words, they think God is wrong. People who are ashamed of the gospel think God is wrong because of what other men have said. Well, I say, brethren, let God be true and every man a liar. <clears throat> Being ashamed of the gospel means, it means to preach that what God has declared would actually threaten their reputation among men. It would actually threaten their reputation in the institution. And so... There are many in our day who are ashamed of the gospel. <clears throat> I wonder what God's going to think about that. Well, Jesus said, For whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my words of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he shall come in his own glory and in his Father's and of the holy angels. <clears throat> but if you're not ashamed of the gospel... You're not afraid to tell other people how God said it. <clears throat> You'll preach it, despite any repercussions that it may bring, even death. You won't compromise the message if you're not ashamed of it. Amen. Why? Because there's power in that message. <clears throat> the gospel is the power of God unto salvation because it reveals to us the power that we have access to so that we can navigate through this life and make it safely home. For instance, we have many enemies that seek to overthrow our faith. Isn't it good news that we have armor to protect us from those enemies? Isn't it good news to hear that there is a way of escape for every temptation and that God will not permit you to be tempted for more than you can bear? The gospel clarifies and ministers these realities to believers in order that they might overcome. And it must do these things or it is another gospel and not the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel of Jesus Christ empowers the believer by increasing their understanding. It's edifying. It leads to an increase in growth and knowledge. Let's go back to this armor for a minute. How are you going to put on the helmet of salvation if you don't know that you're saved? How will your mind be protected when contrary thoughts enter it if you cannot identify those thoughts are not you but sin that dwells in you? Just exactly how are you going to do that? How are you going to put on the breastplate of righteousness? How are you going to do that unless you know that you possess the righteousness of God by faith in Jesus Christ? And it's a real righteousness, brethren. <clears throat> and how are you going to take up the shield of faith 
to quench all of the fiery darts of the wicked one if you're ignorant of the promises of God, or if your hope is weak, or if you're unsure of what you believe in. How are you going to do these things? See, the gospel addresses these things, all of these things. Without a strong hope and a cultivated desire for the things of God at the end of our faith, how will you deny temporal things? If you don't have something greater to look forward to, how are you going to deny something that's presented to you now? <clears throat> Grace flows freely like a river through the gospel message. It's good news to know that Jesus is over your circumstances. See, brethren, you have to know these things because I'm telling you at one point in your life, it's going to appear that the enemy is greater than you. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. But see, if you don't know that, then what, what kind of hope do you have? <clears throat> it's good news. Good news, brethren. The reason, see, the reason what God, of what God's doing, it must be discussed. It must be revealed. The implications must be considered, pondered, chewed around in the mind. <clears throat> Some say that the gospel is this. Christ came to earth as a man. He lived a perfect life without sin. He was crucified, died, buried, and rose the third day, period. Well, that's certainly the truth, but that's a grand bird's eye view, brethren. If that's all that there is to the gospel, tell me how we are going to, with all the saints, know what is the breath and length and depth and height and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Just exactly how is that going to happen with a shallow and childlike message? These things must be expounded. Why did he have to die? Why did he have to be sinless? Why did he come? What did it cost him? What is his death accomplish? These things have to be brought to the table for divine consideration. The necessity in the work of his atonement, his reconciliation, his justification, the necessity of and work of his intercession and mediation for our sanctification, the necessity and work of creating men new through the operation of God, the circumcision made without hands, the access we have to and divine help, the presence of an advocate should any man sin, the great and precious promises of God. And even in these things I have listed, it's still just a summary of the marvelous height, length, width, and depth of our great salvation. We cannot stand without the gospel because without it, we're ignorant. What is a man's strength without the knowledge of God? What is it? Just how strong is a person who is ignorant of God? and what he's doing. My strength not only comes from the Lord, my strength is the Lord. Amen. David said, the Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusted in him and I am helped. Therefore, my heart greatly rejoiceth and with my song, I will praise him. Amen. Aren't you glad when you've experienced help from the Lord? Is when you've experienced these things from God, God's the main thing, and he's making himself known through the gospel. Amen. Amen. There's a beautiful reflection of the attributes of God in this message. Attributes that God desires to reveal. How would we know love without the gospel? How would we fully know and understand mercy or forgiveness? We are only as stable in Christ as we hear the gospel. It's a message that constrains us to look upon Christ. And as we look upon Christ, we're transformed from glory to glory. <clears throat> but it's only powerful to those who believe. The gospel is the power of God and the salvation to those who believe. <clears throat> and this is precisely why we hear Paul tell those whose faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. So as much as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel under you. If you know a people whose faith is spoken of, they're the people that need to hear the gospel and it will produce something in them. It'll be mutually comforting to you 
and to them. It'll build you up. It'll build them up. My exhortation to you, brethren, is to keep the faith and to hear the word of the gospel. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, and the one who is of power will work in you to will and do of his good pleasure. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began. Now, I prepared a, a poem to share with you and I've been, I've been doing this recently after my messages. I've been writing these poems and I didn't know when I began them how satisfying this, this is to, to, to put forth the things that God's given you to see and to, and to have an outlet for it. It's one of the most satisfying things that I've experienced about new life, brethren. And then I considered, I was, I was thinking about the hymn writers. Now, <clears throat> Paul McCartney from the Beatles, it's said in his entire career, He's written around 200 songs, most of which were co-authored with others and not, not a solo thing. But then I considered our dedicated sister, Fanny Crosby, of which it is written. She composed more than 8,000 hymns and gospel songs with more than 1 million copies printed, despite being blind shortly after birth. She is also that she did more than this. She is also known for her teaching and rescue mission work. What's the difference, brethren? One person wrote from hope in this life only. The other person lived from a living hope that was from above. And the difference is... God has made a power to retrieve everyone who hears it and believes... "'Tis contained in the light of the gospel, explained to saints by Christ's apostles, so we can know what God has done in the work he's given through his Son. It saves men from the depths of hell. With joy we draw it from our well. And though in fear it's first received, we find in it our fears relieved. It fills our lack till we're complete and forms the ground beneath our feet. It warms our hearts with new desire. Inside it stokes the holy fire. Our confidence and hope we gain. Our faith is widened and maintained. We move ahead, don't stay the same. No way we're timid or ashamed. It shows us the things unseen, constraining us to serve our king. We see his purpose and his love, our anchors cast in lands above. So when we pass through valleys dreary, a song it brings to lift the weary. And when there winds away too steep, our footing finds it with hinds feet. God is merciful, his grace to shower, and God has given us all the power to fight, to pray, to run, to win, to make it safely unto the end. For not a one can dare afford to shun this message from the Lord. So may in God our hope to be until we cross into eternity.